We are live. Um, I am not going to permit. I mean, you know, I've done all kinds of things uh, over the years, but I started wearing a short fro when I was 16 uh, because I had a bad perm and it took all my hair out so I had to cut it and um, and it really is the thing that that politicized me because you know people were like well what you know uh, <laughs> you're trying to make a political statement and all that kind of thing and so it made me want to understand what the hell they were talking about I was just trying to get over a bad part mm -hmm. and <laughs> But then I discovered that I loved the freedom of of the short fro, and I kept it real short for probably about eight years before I started getting bored, and um, and then I had locks for a while. Hmm. But that was a lot of work, you know. I'm I'm into the easy, no muss, no fuss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm still in search of. No much, no fuss. <laughs> so I like the locks, but they, you know, they really are more work than they look like. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And so then, then I permed. No, then I went through a period. I did the locks for about four years, and then I did the like extension braids and braiding my own hair um, and then I went back to perming for a few years and since then I've pretty much been back to the short fro and I really I love the short you know like I was last summer that really is my favorite thing because I don't want to be bothered with it but it does get to be boring after a while so I've been trying to decide if I was going to lock again or what I was going to do, but now I'm just, you know, I'm trying to see if I can get this like curly, uh, braided or twisted wild yeah. style. Some of the women, like Randy's hair is looking, look, let's look at Randy. <laughs> <laughs> That is just too cute. And I'm like, why can't I get my hair to do something like that? <laughs> you got to lock it again. Oh, yeah? Mm hmm So you had your locks, and then you cut your locks, and that's what's left? No, I folded my lock in half, and then I wrapped it around it, and then I put a rubber band on the end. So it's still... Oh, it's still um, long. Uh -huh. hey. So when I take the rubber band off, it'll like be stringy. It'll be like really curly. Oh, hmm, that's very creative. <laughs> yeah, I watched the YouTube video. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Who's that, Edwina? Hi there. I made it. <laughs> okay. got Great. Oh, my God. All right. I'm just on the shoot. I just I haven't made it to the second chapter, but I'm doing my best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, like. Okay. Like, uh, you should just start in on whatever chapter we're reading because it's going to take a while to catch up because, you know, as you, I'm sure you can see already, it's, it's rather intense, especially the first five chapters are, like, really too much. <laughs> and you have to have at least some knowledge of medical terminology. Yes. Uh, and again, especially the those first five chapters. Once you get by by that, um, it, her writing gets a lot easier. I you know I don't know what happened, but there's like a real switch in style. Um, everything. I think those first few chapters, she was giving it her all, um, and she wore herself out along with wearing out the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed. But yeah. Nina, you made it. Yeah, how you doing? Let's get this party started. Oh, that reminds me I want a cup of coffee. Okay. Wait, hey, no. <laughs> Hi, Tito. Hey. Hi, Randy. Hi, Vanita. How's everybody tonight? 
Star. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Good. No, your your camera, your eyes are not uh, something wrong with your eyes. I am experimenting with a new hairstyle, so don't mess with me. I didn't know what was now. You cute anyway. You ain't got to worry about it, girl. You got it like that. You got it like that. I like that. Do something different. But you look cute. Thank you. Thank you. You look real cute. Well, Georgette, um, huh? Georgette, I, this is probably most of us, right? Yes. This Where's Joel? Is, I don't think um. Mm, he might have technical issues tonight again. He needs a new router. He said. He needs so, a new but he did say he would try. <laughs> what you I say? So. He needs a new computer. Well, yeah. He needs a GoFundMe. I do some GoFundMe. <laughs> See, oh, that's a good idea. I'm mm. serious. GoFundMe, very important. Everybody else is using it, right? <laughs> everybody, it everybody, girl, you call GoFundMe. <laughs> really? Good way to pay the rent. Yeah, I guess. Mm. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, oh, George, yeah, you like writing the day, baby. It was unavoidable. Oh, girl. <laughs> it was. That got a yeah, it looks like what you said. Don't worry about it. I write a whole bunch of stuff because Michelle told me off before, but she'd be nice to you. She's like, oh, 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 oh. Michelle, she turned on you. <laughs> but she always treats y'all nice. She treats you all very nice. But oh, she don't treat you like that. <laughs> that what? Yeah. That's, oh, oh, no. What? <laughs> I, 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 I told Bridget that we were on the phone and you asked about the notes and I said I don't even think about the notes because Georgette is so responsible. But I told Georgette when Benita did the notes, I was worried. You were worried. And I got the notes there earlier. Yes, you did. And, and they were great notes. They really were. That's okay. I won't be doing it no more. See, she done messed up. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Well, I was worried because you had never done them before. Georgette has been doing notes since the first session. So okay, don't try they weren't me. always don't good notes, okay? Now. They weren't always good. <laughs> That's okay, you hurt my feelings. Don't worry about it, Michelle. Don't worry about it. <laughs> worry about it. Benita, I had like two or three sessions of some bad notes that Michelle had to go in there and whip them into shape. Okay, so yeah. Oh, no. you know, she needs nobody down but me, Georgette. I am her whipping girl. The whipping girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Georgette, let's start the meeting. Okay. Welcome, welcome everyone to meeting number nine of the third session of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. We are reading Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present by Harriet A. Washington. And tonight's chapter, chapter eight, The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Reproductions. So, let's go around and everyone introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Edwina. Hi, you, my what? name is Edwina Marchenko. I'm happy to be here. And I've just started reading Medical Apartheid and it has been very intense. Oh. And I had to fall back on some medical terminology that I was not familiar with and um, some of the chapters that I read um, Southern Discomfort, Profitable Wonders, Circus Africanus, and they were shocking. It was hard for me to um, uh, just to uh, take in uh, psychologically how people, how these um, 
Af um, African slaves in America suffered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Adelita, you might enjoy, um, we have a YouTube page and that houses uh, all of the, the videos from our meetings and also what I do with each meeting is is I break it down into clips based on each question or each discussion that we're having. And so when you go to the, the YouTube page um, and look at our playlist, they're organized by the date of the meeting. Um, and then within each playlist, you'll find the, a video of the entire meeting as well as the clips that were made for that meeting. Um, so you might, you know, you might want to take a look at some of those to to see how we were reacting to those subjects. Um, I definitely will in order to catch up because so far, from what I read, the the the, the treatment of these um, African slaves were appalling and shocking. It was. For me personally, for me, I mean, I couldn't. It was incredible. I really couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. You know, even even those of us with as as much as we know, or as much as we think we know um, about Black history, um, she has just presented it in a way that is so raw. Um, that it, it you know it's 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 hard to um, it, comprehend it, yeah, yeah yeah but I really appreciate her in in depth research and how she was able to name mm -hmm. these doctors and so-called scientists and the schools that they attended yeah mm -hmm. yeah in the early from the 1800s to the 1900s and I and I just could not believe that such atrocities were taking place in these uh, schools of medicine not, yeah. and not yeah. only that these um, plantation owners had their own doctors that were committing uh, atrocities um, yeah, but you know what? Let me cut you off, Edwina, because we have a lot to cover with this chapter for tonight, and your head is going to be spinning with with all the stuff that that you will encounter in those first few first few chapters. So tell us though where you're located. Well, I'm located here in Utah now. Okay. All right. Are you out there? Are you near Salt Lake City? Yeah, I'm near Salt Lake City, and okay. it's nice weather out uh, here. Sort of like California um, combination. You can it's hot and cold. Yeah. So you look out the window. You think it's 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 cold, and you step outside, and it's humid. <laughs> Well, we, we, we still trying to get a little humidity on this side. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's spring here. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Edwina, for sharing that. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Randy, can you tell us where you're viewing from? And Hello, I'm Randy, and I'm viewing from Atlanta. And I'm really excited to see everybody tonight. And I'm happy that I'm on time for like the first time in months. So <laughs> this is really nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And Vanita? Hi, good evening. My name is Vanita Walker. And I'm Wayne uh, from uh, Connecticut. Welcome. Thank you, Vanita. And last but not least, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Odom, and I'm in Brooklyn, New York. With a new hairdo. With a new hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Love it. Good. 
And did we get your name, Georgette? I think we did. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm tonight's moderator, Georgette Moses, from Columbia, South Carolina. Whoa. With a very long chapter. Ladies, I'm sorry. It's a lot of information. We'll try to get through it oh, as, as quickly and thoroughly as possible. And as painlessly. Hmm. Hmm. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And okay, so we know who our moderator is for next week. I think that's you, Randy. Is that you? Yes, I work from ten to seven next week. I still want to do it, but I need for somebody to cover me the first thirty minutes. Okay. Well, one thing I I was saying to Georgette um, was that can we can we set a goal for ourselves of having our notes done? Um, sent to me by 24 hours beforehand, so by 6 o'clock on Monday evening. Can we go for that? We can I, set the goal. We, we can set the goal. <laughs> we can set it. <laughs> and it gives us a little time to be late if we have to be late. But, you know, I just, I think we're getting into a habit of of waiting until six o'clock <laughs> and it's stressing everybody out. So anyway, Randy, you know, I'll I'll definitely um, cover the first half hour for you, but it would help a lot if you got me the notes as soon as possible. Okay, that's fine. Okay, okay cool. Okay. Um, and Joelle has joined us. Oh, All right. Oh, well. We, we had two of him. Uh, <laughs> right. Say what? What are doing? Well, you know what? This is, um, I don't know how long this is, is going to last. My IT person down here didn't get my new router, so <sighs> we'll see what's going on. How's everybody doing? Fine, thank you. We're good. We're good. Happy to see you. Oh, I'm glad glad to be here. Yeah, and your name and location? Uh, mine is uh, Joel J J Jones uh, from um, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and uh, just glad to be here amongst the living, not the dead. All right, can't <laughs> argue with that. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. And Joel. Um, I understand you agreed to take chapter 10 for us, is that right? Um, I probably didn't have a choice, so I agreed to it. Yes, ma'am, I did. <laughs> no, very good, very good. <laughs> whatever, whatever makes it happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we need a time? You think we need a timekeeper tonight? I'll keep some time. All Michelle. right, Michelle. No, I, I was going to say I think that's a good idea. This is a lot of controversial topics come up in this this chapter, and you know I'm sure we could go on endlessly. So you sure can, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm ready. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to. No. All right, thank you, Vinny. Okay, uh, I want to remind everybody that the community rules can be found on our homepage on Google and on Facebook. That's is that correct, Michelle? Um, they're not on Facebook. They're not on Facebook. Okay, just on Google mm -hmm. Plus page. Okay, and um, please don't mute your mic, but do be sensitive to your background sounds. And if you don't want to be tagged in the videos, please uh, let Michelle know and she'll remove you. And if there are no, there's no other business we need to cover, we can get started on Chapter 8, The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Reproduction. Oh. Who can, who's, can I get to read the summary? I'll do it. All right, thank you. The Black Stork, the Eugenic Control of African American Reproduction. This chapter illustrates the various ways the reproductive freedom of African Americans have been assaulted 
by discouraging the birth of inferior black children and by curtailing the fertility of black mothers. Americans of various backgrounds and allergenes, allergenes, allegiances, allegiances participated in this eugenics movement. Germans and Americans shared their flawed eugenics practice and beliefs, many of them evolving into current laws and social, economic, and medical policies today. Many women and men have been harmed by these codified beliefs with no compensation. Some of our own black leaders were complicit in this. We still live with the false specter of the crack baby, stigmatized teenage girls as hypersexual and chose to punish and medicate rather than counsel and protect. Okay. Thank you, Vanita. All right, can I get someone to read uh, section A and the two questions that follow? I'll do it. All right, thank you, Michelle. Eugenics, a medical philosophy, question mark. When Barbara Harris, founder of Children Requiring a Caring Community, K, Crack, when Barbara Harris, founder of Crack, comments about the women and men who seek her services, we don't allow dogs to breed, we spay them. We neuter them. We try to keep them from having unwanted puppies. And yet these women are literally having litters of children. She is being totally honest. That's how she feels. And she believes her organization is helping society. When Rudolf Hess, right-hand man to Adolf Hitler, said National Socialism is nothing but applied biology. He was being totally honest too. His methods may have been a bit more extreme than Mrs. Harris for preventing unwanted puppies, but they work so well in fact that we still feel the effects today. German eugenicists learned a lot of what they knew from American eugenicists. In the early 20th century, geneticists like Francis Galton, cousin to Charles Darwin, discovered the mathematical predictability of human traits. Their goal became to use this knowledge in selective procreation to refine the human race while conquering dysfunction. It was an applied science embraced by scientific and popular levels in the United States and abroad. Biologist Charles Davenport used the applied science of biometrics, the quantitative study of evolution, to conduct research on, the human, on human heredity. Leading to public policy like the National Origins Act of 1924 barred immigrants from southern and eastern European countries as dysgenic. The good. Do we have someone with uh, some music or something going on in the background? I don't know. Is is that you with your technical issues, Joelle? No, that was me looking at um. Oh, okay. <laughs> website. I was gonna say that is one of our videos. <laughs> Not like porn music. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Got <you busted. laughs> you, well, you can have it on you Do you know how to mute your mic, Edwina? Yeah, I see up here. I'm just learning how to manipulate. Yeah, I know. Okay. The good. Uh, proposed society 
use, use the good proposed society use medical information about disease and trait inheritance to end social ills by encouraging the births of good, healthy, and beautiful children. The bad, the bad form of eugenics promulgates weeding out undesirable elements of society by discouraging or preventing births of children with bad genetic profiles. The ugly. Scientists continue to look for and find wild physiological evidence of black inferiority to support and popularize their ideas. It resulted in demonizing black parents, particularly black mothers, as medically and behaviorally unfit. Eugenics undergirded medical social movements that placed black sexual behavior and reproduction under intense scrutiny, leading to disproportionate sterilizations and experimentations. The abominable. Dr. Harry J. Hazelden gained fame and fortune in 1915 during the first wave of the American eugenics movement by exploiting the evil legacy of the black mother. He preyed on the sick, defective infants, leaving them to die or killing them outright. He practiced his negative eugenics. He practiced his negative eugenics very publicly. Following his example to remove the genetically inferior genes from their pool, parents began to recruit doctors to kill their children who were born with birth defects. He took pictures with the bodies of these children and their parents and even made a movie entitled The Black Stork to promote his ideas. Question one, do you think Barbara Harris is just a woman, mother, citizen who saw a need or problem and attempted to apply a solution or an unconscious eugenicist? Question two, were you aware of the connection between American and German eugenicists? Barbara Harris, um, I don't know, that was, uh, <coughs> I, 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 I guess I would say I think she's um, an unconscious eugenicist. Um, <clears throat> self-hating black, all, all of that kind of thing. Um, she also, you know how we, we talked about Grandison Harrison and, and what people are willing to do in the name of survival. Grandison Harrison, you'll come across uh, Edwina in Chapter 5. He was a grave robber, a black man. Um, who, who actually started out, at, who was a slave, um, and his assignment was to rob black graveyards for doctors so that they could learn stuff. Yeah, I think I read about him. Yeah, and, um, and but there were plenty other like him that, that followed. Um, so you know, I think when survival is our one and only yardstick, um, that it allows us to do all kinds of things that we otherwise otherwise might think are you know abominable. So I think it's possible that some funding body. Um, offered Barbara Harris some money to set up this program and if she was in the mode of trying to survive um, she may have said well you know uh, I, I may you know uh, I may be a conscious eugenicist <laughs> But if it's going to make me some money, then I'm willing to play that role. So. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Michelle. That's an interesting aspect. You you introduced the finances into that. I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have an opinion? I wanted to ask her about the last question pertaining to the German mm -hmm. uh, experimentation and um, of, of ridding themselves of an inferior uh, race in connection to how that fit in with the American um, notion of um, the, the uh, geneticists. I think you asked a question at one point pertaining to that. Yes, it was. Were you aware of the connection between the American and German eugenicists and how they shared their information? Somewhat, I was somewhat aware of it. Um, you know, through um, newspaper articles and. Um, and, and reading about the German um, Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that the Jewish Holocaust was imminently um, connected, could, could, could be possibly connected to uh, or affect what was going on with um, black Americans. Yes, um, that's true. Um, in some of my reading, uh, the background of it, uh, the Germans who actually they um, were practicing uh, um, this ethnic cl type cleansing on different areas in Europe, and when they started corresponding and reading the. Uh, medical uh, research that the Americans were doing sort of at the same time they were spurred they were encouraged even more to continue along their lines because of the propaganda the American scientists were coming up with in support of eugenics and so-called racial in, or ethnic inferiority genetically um, or, or their search for the, this elite uh, race. I've forgotten the exact terminology of what they called it. Joel, you're a history buff. Aryan nation. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. So, in other words, you're saying that the Germans were in the process during World War II and onward um, in an effort to create, during the Holocaust, to create ethnic cleansing. Oh, and before that, before the wars, they were, all, they were doing it in Europe, in, in certain parts of sure. Europe, to the Slavs and um, the uh, Romanians hmm, and um, some other uh, groups of people. They were practicing, so to speak. The Roman, the Romas, the so-called gypsy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, their their tactics and methods passed on to the American scientists, and they, uh, the Negro, well, the Afro American, the subject of their experiments for ethnic um, cleansing or proving themselves to be. Aryan, um, a part of the Aryan race? I, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Well, what I was going back to was that um, what they were doing in Germany mm -hmm. um, through ethnic cleansing, through the Holocaust and so forth, it affected mm -hmm. the way that um, American scientists looked at the lower classes yeah. here in America, in which 
uh, would affect the, the Afro-American. I agree with you. I think they fed off of each other. Their their arrogance and, okay. and their search for a perfect race fed off of each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would anyone else like to add a comment? Well, in my opinion, you know, just by looking at that, you know, if you're looking at the American Hero Channel, it's just like looking at, you know, a Nazi class. That's what I always call it. You know, you always find out they tell about, you know, the atrocities of the of the Germans, but they really just really teaching more races how to be Nazis in my opinion but I just look at the uh, as the four years in which the, the Nazis they did uh, you know experimentation with the, uh, with the with the Holocaust now you compound that kind of activity with about 350 years in what they freely did to the African slave and you can see that the Germans they learned a lot from the Americans. I mean that's just a cold hard facts. <laughs> you know. Well, that would sound logical, um, especially during um, the antebellum period when the uh, when you when there was the uh, uh, dissections. Of Afro Americans uh, being um, performed by the doctors, um, uh, trying to uh, what discover uh, their anatomy, the functions of their anatomy, and, and the differences between white anatomy and black anatomies. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, and they got to do that. They got to do it every day. If they ran out, they just went and they go and bought a sick slave and they can just do what they want to do. They can just, like they was working on frogs for hundreds of years. And that's the exact thought I had when I took biology class and I remember dissecting a frog and I thought of a chapter I had read about Joyce Hedge. I believe in that bottom, bottom and and belly circus. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas he uh, took advantage of um, an African um, slave woman that he called uh, George Washington's mammy, mm -hmm. and had in uh, which you would say uh, open on uh, uh, autopsy done yeah. for admission. Yeah, that was pretty foul. So I guess you, as, um, as you said, the Germans fed off of some of the acts of these um, American uh, physicians and scientists. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we don't have any more comments about this section, can I get a volunteer to read? I would just say the, 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 the Germans learned everything they knew from the Americans. Uh, there's, there's even a, a, yeah, a comment in this chapter um, that says they thought the American laws were too harsh in some cases. They said the American laws were uh, the the law about um, integrate uh, 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 you know, biracial marriages. Yeah, misogyny. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and how many drops of blood, you know, makes you a black person, um, and and you know who you could then marry. And so they said they had more flexibility. You know, let's say for example, Americans said if you have one drop of black blood, um, then you can't marry that 
you know, a white person couldn't marry you because that one drop made you black. The Germans might have said, well, you could have five drops. <laughs> you know, when they were talking about, um, I saw on the History Channel that they said, well, you know, well, what made a person of Jewish descent? They said, well, it, if you had um, three grandparents, if you had three grandparents the, that were Jews, then that made you a Jew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Joel, will you adjust your camera, please, so we can see your whole face? Please? Yeah, probably if you bring the camera forward a little bit. Yeah, that's much better. Much, mm -hmm. much perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, I got a face made for radio, so <laughs> that's not. Uh -huh. <laughs> we love your face. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Randy, are you bored with us or what? I mean, you know, no. <laughs> you know don't fall asleep. You're going to mess up your hand. <laughs> no, I'm okay. Okay. So, what's next? Let's see. Okay. I, someone to read Section B and the questions that follow the Negro Project. Okay, Margaret uh, Sanger, the most famous American eugenist, is usually applauded as a powerful birth control pioneer and feminist. She is all of those things. Her mission changed over time from women's rights advocacy to eugenics. She shaped, shaped American uh, reproductive policy by uh, killing the Comstock laws against contraceptives um, distribution and founded Planned uh, Parenthood, the 20th largest charity in the United, uh, United States, which <coughs> well, with the help of eugenics and initiatives like the Negro Project, she exploited black stereotypes to reduce the fertility of uh, African Americans. She was a cautious speaker, uh, but uh, Sanger stated in her book the uh, 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 pivot of a civilization that eugenics is chiefly valuable in its negative aspects on its so-called positive and constructive side it fails to awaken any permanent interest. She also offered a slew of case histories describing the eugenics problem that black families uh, presented by uh, making unfounded connections between mental disability, vagrancy, overpopulation in the Negro district and criminal activity of surrounding states. Further, she claimed that all members in the black family she studied either died young, went on to leave uh, lives of high, hyper uh, set food uh, for fertility. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, which I looked that up. And, you know, but anyway, prostitution, violent crimes, uh, or all three. The Negro District uh, is the headquarters of the criminal element. Beginning in 1932, she recruited black leaders to support her cause. This brother, W.E. DeBose, Charles S. Johnson, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., and even... Uh, Hold on a second here, I gotta scroll down. Even the Reverend Martin Luther King on the advice uh, on the advice of the Bulls, she recruited the black church leaders because the most successful educational approach to the Negro is through religious appeal. We do not want the word to to get out that we want the uh, to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea. If it occurs in any of the of their rebellious members, the both further encourage her by saying black churches were open to intelligent propaganda of any sort. Jesus Christ, and that uh, Sanger uh, and other agencies out to get speak speaker before church congregations and their arguments in the Negro newspapers. 
she took the advice and achieved great success by also placing submissive black doctors oh Lord, and staff and doctors and staff soon realized they had no autonomy and uh, and protests so she closed the clinic but the damage was already done Lord Hammer that sound just if you want to really tick me off you talk about the black church but anyway we ain't gonna go on to church. Do not jump <laughs> I'm trying to stay out the God area today for all no, okay. All right. Why do you think uh, Singer's method of addressing black social ills by applying negative eugenics via birth control clinics was so successful? Why does it continue today? You can go ahead and read all of them. In the uh, w. E. DeBose wrote in response to uh, Singer's. Uh, request for support. The, the mass of ignorant Negroes still breed carelessly and uh, disastrously so that the increase among Negroes even more uh, than the increase among whites is from that portion of the population least intelligent and fit and least able to rear their children properly what do you think of this statement and do you see uh, this as a betrayal were you surprised at the names of black leaders who participated in Sanger and their reason for going off? <laughs> right. Thank you. Well, well, well. <laughs> well I'll tell you what. Good questions, uh, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. Now, we have to go to church. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because if you, in my opinion, this is why you see uh, politicians always canvas the black church, and they play, they pay these black preachers with money and they pay them with influence and power and a sit at, at a seat at the table because they can push one button and these sheeple go and follow okay and this is the same thing that this lady did at the particular time with Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and it's still true today you know mm -hmm. and it's just as plain as just plain and simple you know and you know you know if you make it even if it's even if it's faulty logic, if you if you grace them with your divine presence and come and talk to them like they're human beings, they'll feel like they're equal to you and they respect you and they will follow you, sheeple, but you don't give a damn about them or their situation. And that's what they continue to do, and we, like fools, continue to oblige them. And that's why they keep coming with the same playbook, just a different day and a different part of the game. Mm -hmm. That's all I got to say about that. Okay. Amen. Um, well, I'm on it. Lay it out, Vanita. <laughs> Um, uh, members of the black church, you know, it's a hierarchy, you know, from the preacher, the, the bishops, and so forth, on down to just the the tithing, the tithers, the ones who can only put a dollar in the basket, ones who can't, you know, that old the biblical saying, the woman that could only uh, uh, give a little her 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 she her 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 blessings were greater and I when I say that I, I feel that there's classism within the black church um, that uh, I mean that the uh, the the members the so-called members the sisters of the church the fraternities involved in the churches uh, 
Um, it's a matter of where all the support comes from to keep it. It's, it's the building fund. You know, it's time after you have made your uh, uh, tithing, and the first tithing, then before church is over comes the building fund. Always wonder what you know what the building fund was about because the building was you know falling apart. <laughs> you know, hmm. broken windows, new doors, need a fixture and so forth. But I think that they they were praying there on the um, the uh, um, the people who were in the. Uh, uh, let's say lower tax bracket, or even the welfare uh, moms, the ones they would call the welfare queens in the church. They were praying on. They were praying. Uh, they were the ones that were bringing all the babies in the church with them, you know, for prayer to get this, get this blessing, to increase their bounty, you know, and. The church was the a uh, uh, place of uh, historically place of uh, uh, where black people congregate. The most black people congregated, so there was that place was a target, and, and naturally you would find the, uh, the low income bracket, uh, single parents there, and they were the targets to be put under control. More than just the hierarchies of the church, or the boule, or the bourgeois of the church, and that's the problem I have with the black church. Well, I guess I'm gonna have to say a word in support of the black church. <laughs> you, you know, you know, I know y'all ain't gonna do it. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, hey. Hey, I just pointed out what's wrong with it. I ain't pointing out what was right. It well, won't take you, but it won't take you but half as long. Exactly, oh, and yeah. that's, that's exactly my point, Joel. That that it the church was and is a mixed bag. You know, there were always some good pastors and always some bad pastors, and there still are. Um, it, you know, but. It, you know, and I, I'm not a religious person, and I don't go to church on any regular basis. Vanita and I were trying to figure out earlier today: is it Easter coming up this weekend? Yes, <laughs> Easter, April the fifth, <laughs> Sunday, April the fifth. But I, but I'm a PK Edwina, so you know, so I know a little something about about the Black Church. Um, and you know, and I just think in every breath that we talk about what's wrong with the church, we also have to to recall and remember the good things that the church has done. The the people that are there, you know, all of them are not sheeple. All of them are not idiots. Um, a, a lot of them are very aware of what is going on. Um, at all levels, but they're there also for whatever benefits they get from being in community. And it's by being in community um, that that we have been able to make most of the social, political, uh, economic advances that we have made through having those kinds of connections. And you know, my generation is the generation that walked away from the church to a large degree, but the kinds of connections that were made there have not been replaced in any other significant way. And so all we are is disconnected. You know, and personally, I believe that you know, you don't have to have morality. When I think of morality, I think of um, somebody saying, 
you know, well, this you need to do this because it is right. You need to do this be, or not do this because it is wrong. And how do we know what's right or wrong? God says so. Well, you know, that that's where you get to be able to play with people's heads a lot. But whether we have morality or not, I still strongly believe that we can and should have um, an ethical culture, a, 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 a set of values that we want to promote and protect. And so my generation has not created any alternative system to the church that would help us develop a sense of ethics. Um, when Vanita and I were young, there, there was the expression, my word is my bond. You remember that, Vanita? Well, mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. used to say it. And, you know, and it was a statement about character. Um, and so, you know, we're living in this time where nobody much seems to have any character left. And church is a part of where we got that years ago. So, you know, as, as, as much as I know the church is problematic on so many levels, um, it has also done some good for our community. Now, in terms of, of this chapter and W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell and all the black ministers and others, black doctors and others that Harriet calls out, um, that was shocking, and I really don't know what was on their minds. It may have been that they just got paid off to um, be a part of Sanger's uh, agenda, um, or it may have been their sincere um, attempt to want to address the significant issues in the black community, the issues that we still have, you know. And so the one person that she quotes is Du Bois, but I wish she had quoted MLK, you know, or Adam Clayton Powell so that we could get some idea of, of what they were thinking. So I don't know. I just I feel like she didn't give us enough in that passage to to really have much of an opinion. I don't know. I, I just I just believe that uh, a lot of times our leaders. I think we just don't do enough thinking about things that we support. Or don't support, or we don't play devil's advocate enough. You know, people can always come at you with, with, uh, with, you know, um, false facts or misleading numbers. You know what I mean? And and I think a lot of times when we hear these crazy numbers about what's going on in the black community and everything, you know, okay, you know, you say, well, you know, you have X amount of percentage of African Americans doing this, and then you only have certain amount of percentages of another race doing that, a majority race. Well, hell, that may be, you know, that may be their number might be in, you know, might be in the tens of millions, and yours may just be in the millions. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, so you have to look at this this type of thing, and you know how they accent the negative. You know, and they go and they say, "Well, you got this particular problem." You know, go kill your babies. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm. If you kill your babies, the crime rate will go down. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Yeah. But you said things were crimes that were not necessarily crimes. <laughs> you know, right, <laughs> so, right, right. I think we yeah, just don't do enough. That there was a target, and the target was aimed at the poor communities. The single parent homes, the uh, the mothers that were labeled as welfare queens. Uh, let's stop them from um, producing more of these uh, children that the uh, that the taxpayers have to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. If you if you if you if you want to if you want to you know just 
take a you know cultural anthropology class, go and stay, go and stand at the local retail store that's in your area, and watch how many people of all races come up there and uh, use the uh, use the uh, food assistant cards. That'll let you know a whole great deal of things about where we at in society and who needs help in our society. Mm -hmm. And it just ain't black people that need help in our society, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, it's a lot of Caucasians that need help in our society. It's not a bad thing that you need. That's what the hell is there for, <laughs> you know. Really and you're gonna have a certain you're gonna have a certain okay. percentage of people that abuse that abuse anything. And they are um, a high. There is a high percentage rate of them who are on EBT. Who are uh, receiving um, general assistance? So, but they are not. They, their community is being targeted, like the exactly. uh, Afro-American community, the so-called Negro communities, the single-parent home communities, uh, with just the, the mother and her children, and the and the fathers in are incarcerated. They're no. not the targets. Yeah, but they they have they white people have been the targets at various uh, stages of eugenic policies. Um, there's a, a not the exclusive target, but they have been included among the targets. Uh, uh, we call that the military cultural damage. <laughs> okay. 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 There, there's a quote in this book from uh, from Justice Oliver uh, Wendell Holmes that says, three generations of imbeciles are enough." Um, because in the early days of eugenics, they they were passing laws in state after state after state, uh, saying that that mentally defective people. Um, you, you know, could uh, could be put to death. Mm. So you know, in, uh, including white people here in Utah, they just established, uh, reestablished the death penalty by um, firing squad. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. And when um, when that guy, Dr. Hazelden, made the film, um, the Black Stork. Uh, you know, those were 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 white babies among the babies. The the piece that talks about um, parents were coming forward, you know, asking doctors to kill their disabled children, um, and doctors were were proudly doing it. You know, it, a whole wave got started back then um, that included white children being killed because really what eugenics is about is not just the color of your skin but it's anyone you know Edwina mentioned classism uh, in the church but it it really is a class kind of um, yeah attitude that some people are just not fit to live yeah, so because you're disabled, because you're you're mentally you're a burden. handicapped, yeah. you know, because you're a burden of some kind, you know, in their perception, and that's mm -hmm. the problem that it comes down to someone's perception. I think that was the perception of the Germans in Nazi uh, in Nazi Germany. Absolutely, all, all mis misfits, all misfits. Yeah. Misfits, and uh, so that we can produce a superior um, person, yeah, superior yeah. Aryan person. Yeah, Georgette, we're at seven thirty-five. Oh man, and <laughs> we're even halfway through. Okay, moving right along. Uh, I tried to actually get a comment in for the past, but we will move on. Oh. 
Well, why don't you say it, Benita? I mean, well, come on. I don't want to talk over you all. Um, you don't have to talk over, but let us know you're trying to say something. So oh, here's my throat. I said, if I may say something, and oh well, no one heard you. What do you have to say? Yes. Um, I, I just I was not surprised at all by black leaders. Um. Um. Which, uh, betraying us. I wasn't surprised. It's been going on since the beginning of time, even during slavery. We had Joe that said, well, to Tom. Well, Massa, Tom just took an extra piece of bread, thinking that he was going to get some more privileges by telling Massa that Tom took another piece of bread. Then Massa said to Tom, oh, thank you, Tom. You're such a good boy. Then Master went back and, and beat the other man to a pulp. Meanwhile, he turned around to Tom and said, Tom, get your ass back out there and finish doing that work. Tom never got any more special privileges, but yet he bought down some else in the process. So I wasn't surprised at that at all. It's disgusting. As far as the church is concerned, I have a problem with that. If people would stop revering man as they do, and it always led to hell behind Reverend Man. then maybe we wouldn't have these kind of problems. Maybe we wouldn't be able to go into the church and convince people so easily of everything. So I, I you know, but I'm not going to get into the Jesus thing today, what a God thing. It really is disappointing. I mean, I'm not shocked. I'm just disappointed over and over and over how easily black folk will do things to other black folk for whatever reason they may do it. And for them, it probably was fame, fortune, combination. You know, mm -hmm. I've been always sound when I, I was always, Excuse me? May I interject a word in defense of We want to move on, Edwina, because Georgette has a lot here, so... Okay, we'll just move on. I, I'm done. I just think they were deceived. They were deceived. That's it. That's all I have to say. Okay. No. Okay. Here. Okay. What did you say, Randy? I didn't hear what um, Edwina said. Oh, well, she, what said she said they were deceived. She thinks that they're, those black leaders, they were just deceived. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. And since you were speaking, Randy, can I get you to read section two of this by 1962, that section, mm -hmm. and the question? Thank you. Okay. By 1962, the National Urban League and many local NAACP chapters rescinded their support of contraception, suspicious of so many federally financed birth control clinics in their neighborhoods as attempts to discover the best way to limit or even erase the black presence in America. The 1967 Black Power Conference in New York, New Jersey based, uh, passed a resolution that equated birth control with black genocide. They found support in the 1948 United Nations resolution concerning the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide that was a reaction to the Nazi-engineered European Holocaust. Although at least 40% of black by 1972 believed birth control clinics were a tool to eradicate them, something strange had happened. Many black women embraced birth control while black men denounced it. In the words of Urella Brown, a black social worker, Negroes don't want children they can't take care of, but we are afraid to trust you when your offered help has so often turned out to be exploitation. Despite these fears, 87% of surveyed blacks approved of public contraceptive clinics, but 47% rejected sterilization. Washington states that the proliferation of these birth control clinics clearly aimed at African American populations falls within United Nations definitions for genocide crimes. The clinics were numerous, intended to selectively reduce births within the group, and were well funded at a time when health advocates failed to address more pressing issues in the African American community like nutrition, infectious disease control, high infant mortality, etc. She then makes what seems to be a 180 degree turn, saying that although the proliferation of these clinics was unethical, their rise did not constitute genocide because such measures were widely embraced by black women who, wel who welcomed contraceptive choice. 
Is this evidence of victim blaming? What do you think? Well, I know Benita has something to say about that. No, I don't. Contrary, I'll just listen. I'll sit out on this one. Oh, keep reading. Want to keep reading? Huh? Well, we're answering the question. Question number six: Do you think uh, Washington was engaged in some victim blaming? She proposed that the clinics were uh, a form of genocide, and then she changed her mind. What is? I, I was perplexed I myself. Go I ahead, Ray. I didn't read it as her changing her mind. Maybe maybe I read it wrong. Maybe I have to go back and read that passage. But I didn't either. I read it. I thought that she read it like I, I mean I thought she meant it like um because black women had come forward and wanted contraceptive contraception um that in that way it wasn't genocide and that's why the clinics kept you know they were able to stay in business in, in terms of that that aspect of it because black women didn't. You know, like she mentioned something else about like sexual liberation, being able to practice sex without it always ended in appropriation. So right, and he and technically, the proliferation of clinics in black neighborhoods technically did fit the UN definition of genocide. Um, but in as much as black women themselves embraced um birth control then then we couldn't really call it genocide at the same time that that's how I took it to a jet that's how I read it too yeah <laughs> but and then she goes on to say but there are other things that <laughs> fit the definition of genocide um and really, you can't call them anything else because they were done without our knowledge or consent, like forced sterilizations or being used as a part of um, experimentation for different methods of birth control. Yeah. Well, I look at it. I look at it this way. Um, I can't see your face. Uh, I look at it this way. Um, it all ends. They have these clinics and and targeted and uh, poor uh, white neighborhoods. If the if the if the intent was to reduce the population, you know, if the if the, if the intent was to reduce the population, then in my opinion, it is genocide. They didn't, you know, they didn't just have a health clinic there. It was strictly put there to reduce, you know. The rate of births, you mm -hmm. know, and to reduce the population. So, in my opinion, it is a, a form of genocide. It's a contraception, but is that a broad ban? Is that a is that a broad term? Is that does that mean uh, abortions as well? You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know that is that's a form of contraception. It depends upon how they're using that definition. So. I believe it is a form of uh, if they, if they didn't do the same thing in other neighborhoods and it's just basically to just spade them, neuter them, and control the population, reduce the population. In my opinion, is a genocide. Well, I think they did do what I think it had a lot to do also with classism, like somebody said, because um, she talks about the Mississippi epide epidectomy. Even I know that's our next question. They talk about Carrie Buck from the Buck v. Um, Bell decision, and she was the poor white girl. Right. So a lot of white I women know. were sterilized. No, I yeah, I do agree. Sterilization is a form of genocide. I do agree with that. But I don't know. I mean, we just personally, my mom has always been an advocate for birth control, probably because she had us so young, and so she got on birth control after my sister and got off of it and had Keon and hasn't looked back since. You know, so we've just always been. To have that option there is a blessing, but also recognizing that that white people or and you know and black doctors and the church have have deceived us into using birth control as form of sterilization is wrong. So, 
So I do agree with that. It's it's to me. I think this section was complicated, especially because now, even now, so many so many women use birth control not just for for sex reasons, but because people have heavy cycles. Some birth controls help with cysts. I know that's the case in my family. Um, it keeps them, you know, under underway. Some a lot of my family members they stay on their cycles for months on end if they don't if they don't have birth control. Whoa. So it, it helps them regulate it. So. I don't know. Maybe now they, you know, they fixed it. So where is it's any, not so is it? Is any men living in your family? Women staying on cycle? You probably killed every damn body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we have, we have men. Yeah. No, really, we do. We do. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm an advocate too, Randy, for for birth control, and so was my mother, um, who like yours. When uh, uh, when she realized that you know I was having sex, um, she said, you know, this is not what I want you to do, but you know, I know I can't stop you. So if 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 it's what you're gonna do, then you need to get down to the clinic <laughs> and get some birth control. And um, but. I realized through reading this chapter that I was a part of that population that was targeted. Um, uh, I was living uh, in Trenton, New Jersey, in ur a you know moderately urban area um, during those years, during my teens, and. Um, and there was a Planned Parenthood, and that's and that's where I went. And I was on the Depo Prevera um, during that era that Washington is talking about. Wow. <laughs> you know? um, and I took it for about ten years because I did not want to have any babies at that point. And, um, and and it worked. And but after t but I was always nervous about it because I realized that we were the test generation for the pill. I knew that there was no way that they could know what the long term effects were going to be on people because we were. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that were going to provide that information. Well, Carl, so, it worked for me. I had five. <laughs> you, I you took the pill? Five babies. <laughs> Did you uh, take the pill? But yes, you know, while I was growing up and going to college and so forth, you know, uh, the pill was readily available and everywhere you went, even in, on a college campus, uh, Clinics, uh, condoms were uh, uh, readily available. So, plan even going even after I had my babies and I were and I was going to Planned Parenthood for gynecological uh, uh, examinations, GYN, OBN, G, uh, examinations. You know, they made it. Uh, I would always get uh, this talk. After the examination, the doctor would always like to have a sit down with me and talk about my, my um, um, you know, attitude towards contraception. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, you know, but I was, I, I was thinking, I don't remember anybody having much of a talk with me. And I certainly don't remember anybody asking me if I wanted to be a part of um, a, a medical experiment, you know. But after taking the pills for about 10 years, I just started getting so afraid myself that I didn't know, you know, what I was doing. Um, and so I stopped. And shortly thereafter, I got pregnant. <laughs> so they were effective, if nothing else, at at um, reducing the number of births. And yeah, I mean, you can call it genocide, Joel. Um, and you know, and it, and it probably is. 
you know, it definitely, there definitely would be a whole lot more black babies um, if women, if black women had not embraced birth control. But, you know, the problem that I have is there, there's so many people that want to tell black women, you know, we've, we've had black men, we've had white men, we've had white women, we've had everybody trying to tell black women what they can and should do with their bodies. And you know, but but none of but 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 none of none of y'all are talking about how we're going to take care of those babies. And so to me, unless we are simultaneously having the conversation about genocide, birth control, and how we're going to take care of the babies, then then I can't even hear the black man's concern about genocide. You know, black people, our African heritage is, is raising children in a communal environment. I wrote a book of poetry called Sparrow of Sorrow. And what I went through as a single parent raising four young black males during the 90s, yeah. and one little girl, and it wasn't, uh, let's say, it wasn't Disneyland. It, 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 I went through a lot. I really did. And I produced this book of poems. That's great. Abuse and social conditions. It says these poems in this book is about the inner struggle of a lonely black woman who tried to hold on to her family under adverse social conditions only to end up losing to her children in self-respect due to extreme spousal abuse yeah. and violence in the home. The yeah. theme of this book of poems is the sociological and psychological ramifications of domestic violence in the home and it speaks of the, the uh, debilitating losses of family and love. Yeah, well maybe what you can do, because we have talked about um, how to end our meetings on a lighter note because we, we deal with such high, uh, uh, intense topics. It doesn't sound like your book is light, but maybe the fact that it's poetic I have some joyful poems about my babies. Yeah, well, maybe you know, at the end of the meeting, you can you can read us a poem. Um, but you know, I was just saying that that child rearing, especially in this highly competitive, cold, cruel world that we're living in is such a demanding um, responsibility that for black people in particular, if we're not talking about communal approaches to child raising, then we're really not talking about nothing. We're really yeah. talking about masses of children that are not getting the basics of what they need to be fully functioning, whole, healthy human beings in the world as it is today. And so it may be genocide to use birth control, uh, but we are making choices between bringing children into a world without the supports that they need or not bringing them in at all. You know, last week I was talking about courage, you know, and a, 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 and a part of the thing is if we don't have the courage or the capacity or the self-respect or whatever it is we're missing to address our problems as a community,
and find some real solutions, then we are just talking about bringing more and more babies into the world where they can be shot down by any police or neighborhood watchman or whoever has the notion. More and more babies into the world to go through the school to prison pipeline with no hope of any other kind of life. And, you know, at, at some point, I think common sense demands that we ask ourselves, what is the point of that? If we're not going to solve our problems that, that, that exist in the world, why would we be bringing more babies into the world for lives of misery? I don't know. Well, that certainly gives us something to think about. Ooh. Hmm. And, and I think um, it's important to... Oh, go ahead. No, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm. Okay, I was just going to say that it's important that we're able to take something that's meant for our detriment and turn it into something useful in the ways that Edwina and Randy and Michelle explained it affected their lives. And hey, they meant it for you, are evil, but we can turn it into something good. Mm -hmm. So, is there anyone who hasn't read that would like to read section C, part one, and the two questions now? I think. Uh, Edwina, would you like to read? We're, we're at 7.50. Georgette, oh my we're, goodness. We're we are. at 7.57. So, uh, you know, let's decide how much more we want to do. Okay. Because we're say, probably not going to make I'll it through say, the whole agenda. Uh, how, about, how about if we uh, make a part two of this chapter? What do you think? We've never done that before. No, and there's enough stuff there that we could. <laughs> Well, that shoot that I see that right now this is not a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> well. And then, and no, we haven't had a part two and we're not gonna start now. <laughs> you can already piss me off with the Kenneth <laughs> thing and women's choice. Oh my and then, you forgot that. that this is a women's movement um forum <laughs> he and you're gonna talk about bring out of context. That's not what I said. <laughs> and what I was say, we don't feel like y'all should tell us about our body. <laughs> what all I was going to say solutions is, not this, raising our kids. is this us and Jet Jet? Does Jet feel like facilitating next week? Sure, I'll pick it up. I, I will do that. And we'll just move everybody. If, if that's... Is that good for you, Randy, to move to the yes, next? Yes, because I was gonna be, I was gonna be thirty minutes late anyway, and I will, I would like to leave when I'm supposed to. So let's go with oh. me. So it works All right. for you. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have the next time the myth of the crack baby, nor plant, um, and Mississippi, and Mississippi appendectomy. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good because uh, you know, this is catching up to the. It's a lot of reading. It's, 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 it's intense. You want to drop a poem on us right now? It's we to look for something. Drop, drop the mic. Drop the mic. <laughs> okay, here's a good one. No, because, you know, my son, I was lucky. I was blessed, you know. One of my sons um, is a sergeant in the United States Marines, and I'm so happy he made it back from the war right now. Another one is in the Utah National Guard. That's how I ended up out here. This is a poem for since, you know, um, they grew up in a single parent home with just the mother. It's called My Four, My Four Baby Boys. Let's see if I can read it fast. They came into this world one after another. I smile when I think of each one of them. They are not mistakes either. These baby boys, boys brought me so much happiness. I could not wait to take them home. They were with me from the start and stayed to the very end. Our Christmases were so beautiful because they really loved Santa Claus. I'm glad I got to meet 
some uh, nice friends. Marvin is a prince. Freddie is a general. Julius is my Adonis. And Jeffrey is my shiny knight of old. <laughs> so that's something Very nice. that's, happy, that's something happy to say about four baby boys. Yeah. Yes, it is. And it turned out, Jeffrey did turn out to be a sergeant in the Marines. Wow. <laughs> um, and Freddie, he does think he's a general. He's <laughs> my daughter. This is the birthday. It's April the first. As a matter of fact, I was gonna name him Mark Anthony, but the woman next to my bed heard me say that, and I couldn't think. I said, well, "She just stole my baby's name," and I couldn't <laughs> think of anything to name the child, so I just named him Julius, and I said, "Well, don't name him Caesar." <laughs> so I just named him Julius. Julius Anthony. Uh, so you have four boys and one girl. Yeah, one girl. Her her name is Sissy. Yeah. Uh, Cecilia. And I just passed her poem. Um, let's see if I can get Sissy, Sissy, Sissy. Oh, for Sissy, anything that happens to you is all my fault. You are not. You are not with. You are not with family. I know you miss your brothers too. No one wants to be in the system. There is nothing wrong with you either. You were a perfect baby. Blame me for your miss your hardships. I wasn't very strong. I was lost in the woods. My feelings were hurt. I followed the crowd and lost your sweet door to dry your tears. I still love you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Edwina, and thank you, Jack. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, maybe we can make that a regular every time you're here, Edwina. You can you can read us some poetry. We'll get to know your That's book. what you would like. I would, like that. Yeah. would y'all like that? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Had, as a matter of fact, I had three books published, but this one is for oh. You know what we're talking about sociological problems with the black black family. Yeah, cool. And my kids made it. Matter of fact, Sissy just got her a BFA, is a Bachelor's of Fine Arts, okay. and she's a seamstress. All right, all right. Miss Diva. Okay. <laughs> Well, Georgette, um, so the notes are done for next week. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can get through the videos, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's on you, Michelle. <laughs> that's your part. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, I've well, enjoyed it. Good night, everyone. Good night, Randy. Good night, Joe. Good night. 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 Good night.